when an increasing proportion of the back catalogue of world culture is available um, on YouTube or through streaming services or whatnot, um, how do we actually cut through and get uh, audience attention? So digital diplomacy, uh, digital tools hold the promise of being able to have highly targeted connections and to reach out to audiences across um, great distances, but it's also leveling. Um, which means that simultaneously it's empowering, but it, because it's empowering, it also means it's an ever more intense competition for eyeballs um, and in particular uh, emotional engagement. And then there's really interesting things about the uh, intensive and extensive, which people like the um, cultural economist um, Tyler Cohen have spoken about. Uh, so much of Sven's work with his um, uh, branding and strategy agency user kill day is very much informed by a semiotics approach uh, to branding communications and that's something we've been looking at in designing corporate communications and so there's very interesting questions of course semiotics is presumed that we we share common values and understandings around key cultural symbols but if we are very just very shallowly engaging across a vast array of cultural product um, how does that kind of construction, deconstruction, reconstruction, repurposing of meaning um, happen from a practical communication design uh, point of view? First of all, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody, the students joining from Sofia University, of course, everyone who knows me on the uh, Wasada side. Um, I see we're already up at 62 participants, which is fantastic. Um, could I ask just everyone to simply put DD in chat, okay, digital diplomacy. Um, and the reason why we do that is that just simply allows me to capture everybody's uh, name. So we get a sense of the uh, participants there. Okay, um, so uh, good stuff. First of all, thank you very much um, for joining us today. Um, it's a very busy time, of course, in the, uh, the Swedish embassy. Um, particularly busy because of course, you know, you should be on summer vacation now, you know, the, the Swedish ideal, by the time you get to this time in July, um, you should be like that, what it's about 50 percent i believe of the swedish population who actually have a summer house right uh, so you should not be wearing it I'm, I'm not um you should not be wearing a tie um in week three in uh july okay um but also my very strong impression um, over the years uh, connecting with various uh, Swedish, particularly entrepreneurs, business people and whatnot is Swedes are very efficient in their work and very efficient as well in making sure that they keep a work-life balance. And if we were to talk in semiotics terms about perceptions in Japan of Europe um, and Scandinavia and the Nordics, I think you know, Sweden and of course Denmark where um, uh, Jakob Thestrup is uh, and Norway are all very much strongly associated with being not only very innovative but also lifestyle kind of superpowers so that, that's something we can we can kind of come back to in the context of discussion being of digital nomads. Um, Kohei welcome uh, someone else I'd like to introduce to the crowd. Kohe is another SILS graduate um, and uh, is about to be permanently based in Amsterdam. I guess you'll, we can draw you back to Tokyo from uh, time to time. A little bit about Kohe's background. Um, while still a student in SILS um, started, I believe, an internship, which, which because you turned out to be very valuable, um, became a regular part-time job in the British Embassy doing digital communications. Um, then you went to Edelman, um, major uh, um, media monitoring and uh, communications advisory uh, firm, uh, then Ogilvy for a few years, um, then to what fabric Mullen? It's Mullen Low in its new incarnation. I know, I know, spin in its old incarnation is. Uh, all too familiar with the old Mullen Low. Um, so interesting things. Um, but you've recently been uh, freelance and that's what you'll be doing as a communications designer, right? 
Um, Kohe uh, and Sven, this will doubly annoy you. Uh, <laughs> Kohe spent a year in Oxford. Um, and that's an absolute anathema to Sven as a Cambridge graduate. Okay. Um, but while he was in Oxford for the year, and also while he was in Waseda and did a Sotsalon under my supervision, um, looked at um, EU, EU politics, and particularly then in his Sotsalon actually wrote about um, populism and uh, Brexit. Okay, um, and uh, without further ado, then I'll introduce uh, Sven. Uh, so Sven Pallas, I've known for years. We first got to know each other when um, we were both teaching at Keio University. Um, Sven was teaching uh, branding there. In uh, Both of us were teaching in a um, uh, what was uh, a well-resourced and selective and elite program that <laughs> Keio stopped resourcing properly, right? So we both say goodbye to it, um, a kind of a global passport thing. Um, Sven is founding partner, co-CEO of User Cure Day, uh, a very dynamic uh, boutique, uh, corporate strategy, branding consultancy, very strong semiotics uh, approach with a, a wide array of interesting clients. Um, and uh, Sven is active in many in many areas, artistic collaborations. His his firm has had an artist in residence program, for example. So um, very much at the interface of particularly foreign firms engaging with the Japanese market, uh, but really cultural exchange in its in its uh, most desirable. Uh, mutual exchange kind of model and a lot of what you're doing now I understand being based out of Kyoto is looking at interesting collaborations across the cultural and creative industries. Um, so our primary theme today is digital diplomacy but the background context is a broader project um, on cultural diplomacy which has been funded by and I've got anything here I'm going to show the logo Okay, Brussels wants the logo <laughs> in the video as well. Okay, um, that's it's all about dissemination. Okay, uh, so this is the Erasmus Pro Erasmus Plus program, and uh, it's particularly the uh, the Reactive project, and you've got the links to that. Um, so the uh, my own area of interest is the um, what I see as the quite promising complementarities of um, effectively business promotion and also cultural diplomacy. And particularly when we've got the now the um, Economic Partnership Agreement, EPA, uh, Free Trade Agreement in other terms, uh, between the EU and Japan, that explicitly covers the cultural and creative industries. And my kind of starting and finishing point is if we look at 150 years of Japanese engagement with Europe, um, there has never been a clear dividing line between cultural exchange and business exchange, right from when um, uh, both Satsuma and the Meiji government um, set up pavilions at the Paris Exposition in 1871, they saw the dual purposes of using traditional um, arts and crafts industries, for example, and architecture as a way of projecting influence. And uh, so there's always been a very strong model of, of mutual exchange. And I think if we look at uh, what's happened um, at the broader European um, Japan relationship level, we've gone from a period in the, late, in the late 1980s where there was this real sense in Europe that Japan was a threat to recognizing now that Japan is a very strong um, complementary partner. And indeed, overall, the trade the trade balance is now in, in Europe's favor and in many areas in the cultural and creative industries, actually, very strongly um, in Europe's favor. One small exception is actually architecture, where Japanese architects are, are doing very interesting things um, in Europe these days. So my own starting point here is that um, we can meaningfully talk about um, the economic relationship and in deepening economic interdependence and cultural diplomacy, and that there is no tension between those two. In fact, they're very strong um, complements. And the final other background thing I'd say, of course, is anything we talk about in terms of international relations now is in the context of the tragedy of the um, Russian uh, aggressive war against Ukraine. And I think what is incredibly starkly clear um, out of that is that Japan has been one of the most forthright um, non-European, non-Western nations to strongly stand 
against uh, Russia there. And in, in so far as we talk about um, the European Union as a whole as being what we call normative actors of, of taking a stand on, on principles and uh, law, um, uh, human rights and whatnot, uh, international law, then we see that uh, Japan and uh, Europe's interests are very much aligned. When we do a deeper, deeper dive, of course, into both cultural exchange um, and particularly in terms of normative active stance, we see that the, uh, the Nordics uh, are particularly well aligned um, and that there's also a very strong mutual goodwill between the Nordic states um, and uh, Japan. Okay, so uh, the final person to introduce to those who don't know him is uh, my longstanding collaborator. Uh, partner in academic crime, Adam Johns. <laughs> um, Adam is, um, there's, there was a typo in the, pro, in the overview. It, sh it should have said actually he's head of the Department of Management. I think it's a bit aspirational. I turned it into Department of, of Marketing, right? So you're Professor of Marketing and Head of Department of Management at Sophia. Um, That's correct. Yeah. Good. I mean, last year we actually ran a half semester collaborative course. Um, um, yeah, yeah. on your side and ours yeah. when we were still doing things completely online um, but a combination of going to the, uh, the kind of the primarily face-to-face -face mode um, and different um, class schedules made it more difficult to do this time but in this captain exercise we're we're back to we put the old firm back together okay um, which is a good thing okay uh, so I think that's that's um, all from me. Um, I'd like to bring in now uh, Nordica Yagi. Uh, Nordica has been working with me on the uh, the Reactic project, and one of the things that Nordica has been doing, also with uh, another team member who's unfortunately working full time now and can't join us, he's got client meetings. Um, Taiki Jo um, has been to look at the digital presence of European member states. Um, in Japan. And we did this exercise, first of all, um, early last year and then revisited 12 months later, the logic being that, um, uh, of course, European member states were already being focused on digital communications, but that the pandemic dramatically increased the imperative for that, but that there's a long um, lead time. And I remember interacting a lot with Nordica and Nordica came back and said that she thought far and away the uh, most outstanding in terms of Japan specific digital communications was actually um, the Swedish Embassy's um, Swedish Digital Village Initiative. And fortuitously, and we'll hear from Gustav in a moment, um, that's been uh, refreshed and we'll hear the background objectives and uh, imperatives in relation to that. But Nonica, maybe you could speak a little bit, first of all, to the, uh, the broader overview um, in terms of, of what, you, what you've discerned with particularly European states, but we can go broader than Europe, of course, in terms yeah. of digital communications here and here aimed at Japan. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Narika, as Chris has mentioned. Uh, I graduated from Waseda last September and over the last year I've been doing research on digital communications carried out by the EU member states in Japan. So as Chris has mentioned, just a little background on the research. March last year I assessed embassy websites for examples of digital cultural diplomacy in it, extent of localization for a Japanese audience alongside their accessibility and social media presence. So it was very interesting to see the discrepancies and efforts by each of the EU member states ranging from some websites that were slightly confusing or harder to navigate or sparse uh, to websites that had shown the most thought and consideration into interaction in the digital era. So France Embassy in Japan in particular had very good social media presence, splitting different post types for their Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages, uh, as opposed to posting the same content across all their SNS platforms. And so from then on, considering how uh, COVID had shifted most of our interactions online, I then revisited all the websites once again this year to see if there are any developments from last year and was pleasantly surprised to have found some drastic improvements uh, to their digital communications by countries such as Slovenia, Latvia, and Italy. Uh, while the Latvian embassy website was fairly inconsistent across its Japanese and English translated pages, they had launched a website uh, to celebrate, uh, I think it's the international presence of Latvia, 100 years of it, 
and created a Latvia Japan website uh, to share Latvian cultural events happening in Japan right now. Uh, and Italy, most notably, uh, launched their global cultural website in October, just last year. Uh, I think I'll share the link in the chat so that everyone can take a look in their free time. Uh, it covers an extensive range of topics from food, fashion, entertainment, to healthcare, culture, uh, agriculture, and technology, and even shares startups that have been in the forefront of contributing to Italy's culture. Um, there were some efforts for localization in regards to translating this website into multiple languages and also videos from different ambassadors that resided in different countries to celebrate the launching of the website. And so I can only assume that it will continue to develop, to develop as the months go by, and I'm very excited for its potential. They've even created a Spotify account to share podcasts, which I think is uh, pretty interesting. So typically, I'd say cultural exchange carried out by the majority of the countries on a localized context usually only involves events such as film festivals or art exhibitions or food exchanges. So I thought I'd share a couple of highlights in terms of localization amongst all the examples I've seen. Uh, Netherlands, I'd say, has a, a comprehensive cultural website on a global scale. Uh, it's called Dutch Culture, and they have made efforts in localization in Japan, such as their Netherlands Kantel, uh, and Holland Kyushu interdisciplinary cultural programs. And Sweden, as Chris mentioned as well, was among one of, if not the best example of digital cultural communications uh, with Sweden Digital Village, providing an interactive fun interface and design. And I hope to learn more about the reasons behind this decision to create this website today from the Swedish embassy, as well as all the insightful things our discussants have to say today. Right. Thank you very much, Nonika. That was uh, super efficient. <laughs> um, if anyone's interested, the, uh, the our most recent interaction, I think we've got like a 60, um, a 60 slide, uh, 60 page slide stack, um, very specifically just on very, very micro insights that um, Nodica has picked up in terms of what works and what doesn't, um, in particular design of websites and interfaces. Okay, um, good stuff. Uh, uh, over to you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just flag um, the, the inner Swede in me. Uh, <laughs> my uh, mother's maiden name is Patterson, and um, my great great grandfather was called Gustav, Gustav Patterson, and he came from Stockholm to Australia and started a dynasty. Um, very small dynasty. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, I don't bear the Patterson name. So um, yeah, I, I didn't get the good Swedish look. So this is no insult to the Scots in the, the this is the Scottish ancestry that kind of took over. Um, so good stuff. O over to yourself. And thank you very much for joining us when you should be on holidays, particularly after all of the work with the huge ministerial visit that you've had to, uh, to get through in recent weeks with your team. So thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. It's, it's, uh, uh, do, can you hear me, everyone? Uh, yeah, just to check that to start with. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm glad to know there's a, there's a Swede in you there, Christopher. And, and thank you also at this, this time of year. Sweden is percent of us have summer houses, more or less. And that's where most of us uh, hang out. But I'm Sweden, Sweden, of course, but a Sweden, Japan for the moment. And since we are a fairly small embassy, some uh, 30 people uh, out of which eight are sent out staff from Sweden, we need to take turns in terms of vacation. So my five week vacation starts in, in three weeks. Um, but, but you're right that this time of year, it's, it's um, not many emails actually coming in uh, after midsummer from, from Stockholm. <clears throat> uh, so most work right now is self-induced. Um, Thank you so much for, for inviting me to this. And it's super interesting already to hear uh, the overview you've done looking at different embassies. Uh, it struck me when I heard you, uh, Norika, speaking there that um, I guess the level of digitalization of, of any country uh, in terms of governmental agencies domestically kind of reflects uh, the level of digitalization in, in the, that country's embassies. We are, embassies are after all, just state, state agencies abroad, governmental agencies abroad. And so it would be very interesting as a next step if you could compare somehow uh, the, the findings you had among those embassies with, uh, with the level of accessibility online in those countries domestically. In terms of Sweden, 
uh, we are uh, just like the, the, the Nordic region we're in, a very digitalized country. And there is a high expectation on our embassies to be present online, both in social media and, and on web pages of various kinds. Uh, we don't anymore have uh, the yearly contest of the golden tweet, uh, where, where the embassy with the best tweet in terms of uh, retweets and, and an interest uh, got a prize every year in August in Sweden. But we have similar things where we, where we get acknowledged as an embassy for doing work online of different kinds still. Um, thank you so much for lifting also the digital village as an example and, and acknowledging our work with it. Uh, it is, I should say, an experiment uh, that we've done only in Japan, um, but it has gained already a lot of, of positive attention and, and traction here. Um, uh, and we'll see maybe if, if others, uh, other embassies uh, of Sweden around uh, will be doing similar things. Um, but the, the different embassies, of course, uh, around the world have different focuses. Uh, some are, some are um, focusing much on development in certain countries, some other are more consular or political, depending on uh, how many suites are going there or what type of polit political situation we're working in. In Tokyo, uh, the embassy of Sweden is focusing very much on promoting Sweden and Swedish business um, on this, uh, the world's third largest market. And our long-term mission as an embassy is to create jobs and, and uh, trade for the Swedish economy. And if you, if you think of it, this is actually, in a sense, going back to the origin of diplomacy, uh, starting to build embassies and, and having, having OIS uh, around the countries of, uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, it started as a way of, of making trade smoother, of course, and solve problems before, before, before they occurred. And that's still what we're doing here. And our surveys in Japan, they show quite clearly that we have a positive image of Sweden in Japan, of the Nordic countries in Japan. We have the expression of hoko in, in Japanese, the Nordic countries. Not all languages have expressions for the Nordics. Most, most, most people speak about Scandinavia, but here the Nordic countries is, a, is an idea uh, among regular people. And uh, this is something we make use of. Uh, we work a lot together, um, the five countries. Um, but at the same time, the image of Sweden in Japan um, shows that we are not super well known. It's not the case that the Japanese wake up every morning and think of Sweden uh, the first thing. Uh, but when they do once in a while, they think positive things like care for the environment, like you mentioned, Christopher, uh, work-life balance, gender equality, quality of life. And these are also the values that we try to focus on a lot in our communication uh, in all our different channels. Um, if you wish, to call it soft attempts to soft power, that's 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 where the Swedish soft power would try to uh, would try to focus. And and uh, the idea of a lifestyle superpower, this is the first time I had this expression, but I think it's a beautiful expression. We'll try to uh, we'll try to um, live up to that as much as we can, of course. Um, and in terms of business, Swedish companies in Japan, some of them are known to be Swedish. Maybe IKEA and and Volvo comes to mind, but most of the Swedish companies in Japan are less known. Most of them are not, uh, not B2C, but rather industries exporting uh, uh, metal powders or machinery or, or, or wood or what it could be. Um, uh, it's not directed to consumers, so people might not know them at all. At all. And if they know them, they might not know it's Swedish. Um, in some markets, Swedish companies are not necessarily branding themselves as Swedish companies, but in Japan, they do more than anywhere. And, and many of our bigger global industrial companies that aren't very big in Japan on the Japanese market. Um, they therefore need to, to uh, have more support here maybe than in other countries to be seen and to stand out, which is why many of them choose, I think, uh, to emphasize their, their Swedishness. So what we do as an embassy in terms of communication and cultural diplomacy affects their brands and what they do with their brands affects uh, affect the, the, the Sweden brand or the Swedish, the image of Sweden. Uh, at least to some extent. So with this in mind, we have been trying a lot to, to combine our different areas of what we call Sweden promotion um, and uh, business promotion as much as possible. So all Swedish companies, more or less in Japan today, are striving to be forerunners in sustainability. 
uh, and we're trying to bring them with us when we talk about the green industrial revolution ongoing in, in the north of Sweden today with fossil free steel. We had the first vehicle uh, built with, with no uh, CO2 emissions at all uh, earlier, uh, earlier this year, or was it last end of last year? We have the electrification of transport ongoing and we're building value chains for, for batteries in the north of Sweden. Um, other concepts that both Swedish government and most Swedish businesses are underlining in, in communication, it's innovation, creativity, transparency and smart digital solutions. So in many ways, uh, what we have a mission to talk about as a branch of government abroad and what Swedish companies are interested to talk about, they very much correlate and coincide here, uh, which makes it easier for me and for my colleagues. Um, so considering all this, um, our embassy here in Tokyo, uh, right in the middle of, of Ropongi Chome, um, more than anything, uh, is an event space. Um, as mentioned, this is not the case in all countries, but here in Tokyo, our embassy is very much an event space. We have lectures, exhibitions, concerts, receptions and dinners. Almost every night of the week, there is something ongoing here directed to the public or a broader audience than just an invited guest or two. Um, so this embassy is very uh, open. It's, it's, we're trying to be very welcoming and, and inviting the Japanese public to come in and, and meet with Sweden in various ways. And that openness itself is of course a message about Swedish transparency and accessibility. Um, so when the pandemic came and hit our embassy, uh, just as, as uh, it hit others, other organizations and companies and, and everyone, we closed our gates very much. And the idea with the digital village came up in this context, of course. So this was a way to, found, to, find, um, to find a way to, to continue to promote this openness, to continue to welcoming visitors to our premises in a, in a sense, and to continue to collaborate with all the stakeholders that we include in, in, in Team Sweden being companies, uh, other state agencies, the Chamber of Commerce. We have uh, what used to be called the Swedish Export Council, now, now Business Sweden, in the same building where we sit. Um, so just like, just like other countries, we also have a very formal uh, centralized website called Sweden Abroad. Um, where you can find any of our embassies or, or other agencies abroad. Um, but this is a, this is a pretty um, uh, controlled one. Um, you can find the same type of information, the same headlines in every country. And that's where you turn to find information about, about visa applications or passport production, opening hours, et cetera. But it's not very dynamic as a marketing platform. Um, so we moved all our, our activities online when the pandemic came and webinars, political discussions, the, what we call online FICA, perhaps some of you have seen it on, on, the, on the village there, uh, promotional campaigns of different kinds. We moved all that online and, and um, there's also a need of course for information still about studying in Sweden, working in Sweden and, and also our Swedish events taking place in Japan still also during the pandemic. So we wanted to gather all that in one space um, and keep the accessibility and the openness and to collaborate and signal to Swedish companies around that we're still here, we're still here to, to support and help and, and, and collaborate. Um, and to meet, I think, I hope that all our different target groups in Japan can find something on this page uh, of interest. Um, so, so that's how, how it came about and uh, some about uh, some, some thoughts on, on why we did it. Um, a solution to communication problems uh, during the pandemic. And we've now had some 20,000 individual visitors to it. If you compare that to how many people during these two years would have come into the embassy, of course, it's, it's a big hit. I mean, in a, in a, in a positive sense, um, uh, like a hit song. Um, but um, it's also the case, of course, with web pages like this, that you need to you need to update them, you need to work with them in order to uh, to keep them being interested. We have uh, just now added a, added a pavilion, as we call it, called uh, Work With Sweden, where you can learn more about recruitment and, and these kind of things. Uh, but as mentioned in the beginning, this is an experiment still, and we'll see for how long we'll have this. Uh, now more and more things are actually happening within our, within our gates. And uh, 
yeah, it's been a positive experience and we'll see for how long. Um, I got a question on uh, fu the future of online events. Uh, I, I think this is, a, this is a very interesting question. Of course, right now, uh, I don't know how you feel. It's, it's fun to see all of you online like this because uh, uh, we use different platforms where you don't see each other as, as well. Uh, and I understand that studying at university uh, today has become this to a large extent, right? Uh, and it's quite exciting to be part of it and see see what it's what it's like for you. Um, but I guess most of us are a bit tired of the online platforms, aren't we? At this at this stage, uh, and we hope to to stop it. And I think um, I've, I've read a couple of analyses on on what will happen next. I guess once we declare or or so that this is over and we can start meeting again if that happens uh, then then we might not have as much use of these platforms for a while but there may well be a rebound um, coming back to you making use of the good things of of being online like this where we can reach out at least for us in terms of event making i i foresee that we will keep doing hybrid seminars where we uh, maybe a, a number of core guests are in, in the physical room while we, uh, we are live streaming. Um, one idea is that we'll have satellites, satellite events where you, uh, you have one big event and at uh, other places around the world or in the country, you have smaller ones where you, where you see it all online that you actually meet with people to discuss as well. And maybe you serve the same food to get the same, to get feeling that it's, it's the same conference or so on. These kind of combinations are maybe to expect it from the future. Um, I hope so at least because we've learned a lot during this time, haven't we? Um, but sure, engaging audiences uh, online is, is tricky. Even when we speak about digitalization and, and these kind of things, uh, which are sort of natural to have uh, as an online subject, it's, it's harder to, to make people listen for long. So I will, uh, for that reason, not the least, uh, stop there and uh, hope to have a discussion if, if possible. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Gustav. This, uh, yeah, this that's incredibly rich, and uh, we've we've got so many people who can contribute on that. Um, and I, I'm I'm very grateful for you uh, bringing it back to this broader question of kind of hybrid hybrid or what we're calling in the university context high flex, where you um, have lots of people in a room, uh, but you also have some people online. Actually, the way the Design and Corporate Communications class, which uh, quite a number of students uh, from that are participating in this session. Um, most people were in a room and we had a couple of people remotely. Uh, <laughs> and I was quite happy to do it because the quality of the remote participation, well, no, the quality of the participants remotely, particularly Fred, uh, <laughs> um, he earned his stripes um, being a key participant when we were doing High Flex as well um, last year. So, uh, you know the the uh, the old the old story about um, uh, good events, good authors, good good chefs, all the rest of it need good audiences, right? <laughs> they need savvy consumers, and so there is this kind of mutual dependence. And so, to some degree, we need, I think, a kind of a, a culture of active engagement when um, any kind of online event is just simply reduced to just something you'd see on Hulu or you know um, Netflix or whatever streaming service you use on your on your device in a very passive kind of way, then it's quite frustrating. Um, on the other hand, um, the uh, the capacity to collaborate across distances, you know, we have um, people here today uh, going to be in Paris in in Copenhagen, Kyoto, um, over in Yotsia. <laughs> uh, uh, so this, this uh, really does um, empower us in certain ways. And so I think everyone is going to be exploring creatively. Um, what I just simply say from a teaching side is that it has it's been empowering, but it's also been a heck of a lot of work. It has permanently changed what we do. I am incredibly conscious now that when I actually expect people to come to a campus, sometimes that involves an hour and a half travel or whatever, that it actually has to be worthwhile. Um, and I did a very small survey of students just in feedback because we did a topic about um, very specifically the university as an enterprise last week in a huge introduction to business class 180 students and 
some of the comments were too many boring face-to-face -face classes, not worth coming all the way to campus. Um, so that really is quite confronting, you know, where the, the onus is now on us to actually make this more engaging uh, content. Um, uh, one of the class members in Design and Corporate Communications quipped that um, since 2020, we've, we've been kind of like Netflix Daigaku, uh, Netflix University. Uh, my response to that was try try getting a job in a prestigious company with a Netflix subscription, you know, that's not going to cut it. Uh, so we have to really ask ourselves in terms of what value proposition are we providing um, to our audiences? Are we enabling and empowering them uh, to learn, to engage, to, to realize their conception of the good? And I think exactly the same thing carries over to digital diplomacy. Um, I might go first of all to Adam Johns, our co-host for reactions. And then I'd like to bring in um, Sven, if I may, um, and then Jakob, very specifically from a, from another Scandi perspective. But um, mm. Adam, first of all. Yeah, great. Thanks, Chris. Um, and uh, thank you to Gustav for a for, you know, great introduction uh, to, to all that, that uh, you know, Sweden is doing, uh, particularly here in Japan. Uh, I, I've actually written down uh, your message. I'm hoping to kind of to, to use it or reuse it or at some other uh, point in time, this uh, this idea that people don't wake up in the morning thinking of Sweden, <laughs> and I thought, you know, maybe from a brand management perspective, what a wonderful kind of um, kind of uh, um, an objective, you know, kind of uh, for, for well, what do we want people to do? We want people to wake up in the morning and to think about us, <laughs> which well, not for, not for brands, for people in general. I think that's probably what what a lot of people in life are looking for. <laughs> um, um, but I mean, on on. From Sweden's perspective, the ironic thing is that that many people might be waking up on a bed from IKEA or taking, you know, turning off an alarm clock on a on a table and from IKEA or going and having a mug, you know, a coffee of with a coffee mug from IKEA or the like, but but still not necessarily thinking of uh, of Sweden, you know, as as a brand or Sweden um, in terms of all of the different values and, and attributes that um, that that might you know be uh, so central to what to what sweden is is uh, wanting to represent and um i thought that was a, this a really nice um uh, kind of demonstration of that, that that you mentioned there with the with the idea of having the the embassy as an event space and as a, and and that not simply just as message you know trying this is what we want to this is what we want to tell um um, you know, using some copy or some cute little uh, or some very nice or succinct little, um, uh, you know, message that we've, we've got, but actually through a communicative um, action and, and using the space to, to communicate this openness, as you said, openness as a message that, that hopefully um, will then um, indicate, you know, through that, through that, uh, that action, much about the transparency and some of the, the, the things that, that Sweden um, as a as a country or as a, you know holds holds dear and is is really important and critical or important part of the the identity that you're wanting to put forward, and so I thought that was a really uh, nice uh, kind of uh, a message, you know through through action, uh, in in that regard. Um, just a final maybe uh, I won't I don't want to occupy too much of the time because we've got some really great um, panelists and discussants here today, um, but uh, I thought in in in. The other thing that I was quite struck by with your uh, comments was, uh, and this is, I think, with classes both at, at Waseda and Sophia, something that uh, no doubt have been looking at over the, the, the course uh, this semester, is the idea of these multiple constituencies, multiple you say, you know, target groups, that it's not simply one group of people that you're talking to. Um, but and you're not necessarily one, you know, that customers are not necessarily the end result. But you've got um, all different sorts of, of publics and and, and um, um, you know groups of, of uh, stakeholders that you're trying to appeal to, and you know coming up with a way to to create a mess a message, whether that's through action or through through word. Um, or through some kind of event or digital initiative is is actually a really uh, a, a critical challenge and you know what is something that is going to be consistent uh, across and be, a, be is going to resonate you know with all of those different audiences uh, I think is a is a critical challenge uh, for for not just for any uh, 
company, but for, for in particular, you know, for uh, countries involved in in diplomacy. And so I think there's, there's a very nice message there, uh, you know, particularly with the uh, with the digital uh, village um, initiative there, which is great to see. So I'll uh, thank you, Chris. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass uh, the, the baton uh, on or back, and I'll, I'll let. Uh, Thank you very much, Adam. I'm really glad you picked up on those two things. And what, what really struck me too in Gustav's remarks there was the embassy being a space. And actually, um, in the designing corporate communications classes, uh, we had um, several weeks very specifically on designing communicative spaces. Um, and uh, more and more, as, as so much communications become digital, the, whether it's the pop-up space or the event or whatever, actually becomes an important kind of uh, kind of complement to that. But also this fundamental point about speaking to multiple constituencies and Adam's research and um, advisory work and whatnot, primarily centered with um, dental corge uh, uh, artisans out of places like Kyoto makes you very alert to the fact that there are multiple constituencies and that it's um, it's one thing in a hierarchical corporate structure for top down to, a, to a, in a sense, impose a visual identity or brand identity or a narrative um, and have the full the full authority of the organization to impose that. But of course, um, when you're actually trying to brand a place uh, or a, a nation or God forbid, the European Union, there's such a multiplicity of, of constituencies. But I think even for companies, it's getting much more difficult when we go digital. And one of the last examples we had in the course was um, the problem with uh, even just the basic thing with websites that um, simultaneously you've got customers and potential employees landing. And so we had one, one example there of an of a innovative company now that Panasonic has taken over called Blue Yonder. Um, one part of the website talks about their, their, they are relentless in their commitment to customer service. Another part of the website talks about how they value each individual employee and work-life balance and whatnot. So, and how you reconcile those things, you know, on the one hand, the company is, is telling their employees that we, we're going to treat you really well, but by the way, you have to be relentless in your commitment to serving um, customers. So in the past, when it was analog through very narrow communication channels, you could be lots of different things to lots of different people. Um, we see lots of politicians suddenly discovering that um, uh, what, you what you say down in some small town in Kyushu doesn't stay in Kyushu, that it very quickly goes um, not just viral, viral nationally, but potentially um, internationally. Uh, and I recommend for anyone who hasn't engaged um, with the uh, the long term damage that you can do to yourself through even one clumsy tweet, uh, John Ronson's book um, "So You've Been Publicly Shamed" um, is quite striking. And it, just one observation in relation to that, with the Golden Tweet Award, um, some of the most shared tweets are absolutely devastating for the people who didn't think very carefully when they sent them off. <laughs> so uh, it can be the equivalent of jibakutero of simply blowing yourself up. Um, so you need to be very, very careful, of course, in how we, we on the one hand, be very responsive um, and make the most of the timeliness that um, digital communication presents, while also alert to the fact that we can do really profound, irreparable reputational damage with a few ill-chosen words. Um, huge array of issues arising from um, Gustav's presentation. Um, Sven, can I bring you in as someone who's worked with a wide array of clients, yeah. many European, but much larger than that, and get your own, own take on the issues? Well, when I was listening to the comments earlier, I think for me, it comes down to sort of two key points, which is relevance and reach. So um, if I can speak first on relevance, because I think it's important going back to that you're talking to multiple people at the same time. Um, I was momentarily living in London for six months at the end of last year. And I thought it was very interesting then to talk as the person who runs a company out of Tokyo and to try and and you know, convey the necessity to work with Asia, aka Japan, as sort of the center point for that conversation. And I was quite often met by um, confusion. Why, why, why Japan? Why would I? Why would I need to care about Japan? I mean, if you were in Seoul and you were Korean, then I guess this would make sense. But why would I need any kind of expertise out of Japan? And that just sort of showcased how Japan has managed to. Uh, render itself almost irrelevant by not pushing enough um, its current narrative. Um, and through that then, 
with the likes of Squid Game and other content from, from Korea, Korea is now, you know, the place to be looking for ideas and innovation, because inevitably, we always first look at culture to then um, inform our opinion about a place. And, and what I find so striking is you can, you can um, put all the statistics out there. Japan is the third largest economy in the world. It has been the leader for many, many fields. But in the end, it's, it's emotions that dictate um, facts because, because then suddenly the clients that I would be speaking to, they, are, they would never admit that it's squid game, but it is ultimately that narrative that is, that is then feeding, this is where we should be looking. And so I think it's really great how uh, the Nordics and particularly Sweden have really understood that um, culture is, uh, is absolutely foundational to have that dialogue and to become relevant and that people sort of make assumptions that, oh, well, if the Nordics understand what good life is, um, what quality of life is, then inevitably also the brands, the products from there must also have a same ethos. And, and I think you're doing the right steps, particularly in Japan. And I think um, that you're also not, you're, I, I, what I really like is you sort of off, are offering ideas or concepts, um, but you're not, um, overly um, preachy about them as, as, a, as, a, as a space, which also mean, means that I think there's a lot of this that Japan has managed to reinterpret for itself, but ultimately you always have the Nordics as the gold standard um, for a certain way of life. So, so meaning to say that lots of others then keep promoting on your behalf. Um, and so I think this, 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 this digital initiative is just a, is another great piece of the puzzle. Um, I would say, though, that um, ultimately the internet has become just uh, the, the largest phone book in history. And if you don't know what you're looking for, there's no way of finding it. And so it's great that these resources are there, but also to make sure that they actually are visited, I think, is the hard bit. Um, but I still think it's good. And that, that sort of brings me to that topic of reach, where... Um, on behalf of what I can say on behalf of the British Chamber of Commerce, on, I'm, I'm part of the exec, executive committee there, COVID has been in one way a disaster because most of the events were always done in person and it's what people wanted. They wanted to meet other people for networking events. Um, but inevitably, it also meant that um, everything was always about Tokyo. And Everything, everything always got consolidated into Tokyo. And even if you were on the outskirts of Kanagawa, you did not matter. Um, let alone if you were in Osaka or Okinawa, you just did not matter, even though this was the, the, the entire British community, supposedly. And so by going digital, it means that you could then don't no longer just reach a very small pool that is Tokyo, but you're actually talking to the entire nation, which also meant that actually new membership models were introduced um, because now we have something such as a in-person member. So somebody, so then you get discounts for physical events or you can be a purely remote member. And then that actually also just opened the door because somebody in Osaka is remote the same way somebody in Malaysia would be remote. And so that you just sort of open it up and say there are sort of like, there's, there's, the, there's the physical and the, the digital, and they can coexist, but they need to be also treated as slightly different spaces. And, and I'll, I'll finish up by saying, I mean, there's, of course, demand on both sides, but they're very, but they're slightly different demand sets. So it's, so we've also found that um, when we did hybrid events, it, it meant that the total number of attendees actually went up. So it, there wasn't so much of a cannibalization of, oh, the people who would have who would have in the past come in to the physical events then went digital or vice versa it actually means that you're speaking to do two different groups and bringing them in in different kinds of ways and so it's worked actually very well excellent so really really profound insights there and um in, 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 there's a striking parallel isn't there with the way um, media subscriptions are working and uh, you know so I think all of us you know when we're from somewhere else we we tend to have a media subscription to our kind of our home media and engage in a completely digital kind of way um, and sometimes they're actually more up on the news than uh, locals are um, what it means of course is when you do organize um, uh, events and if someone happens to be in Tokyo um, on a work trip or whatever um, then they're more likely to become an active part of, of an audience. Um, 
thank you for the very confronting um, uh, honest comments about the questions of relevance and perceptions, um, particularly relative to uh, South Korea. I've got uh, a number of um, very impressive participants from South Korea as well. Um, again, just to go back to the uh, the the engagement thing with uh, digital, we've got we've got people like Fred, uh, um, who is joining us from uh, Seoul today. Uh, Jakob, uh, could I bring you in for a uh, parallel uh, Scandi perspective? Um, yes, yes, right. yes, Chris. Um, um, yeah, oh, I, just I, a bit of I, a bit of background on on uh, about about Jakob because you're someone I didn't introduce directly. Um, so, uh, graduate of uh, Copenhagen Business School um, and uh, Bocconi in Milan, and um, finishing off a doctorate at um, Tokyo University, but based currently out of um, Japan, and involved very uh, design and market research consultant. And um, at one point was actually involved in um, promoting uh, Danish exports in Japan, right? So, oh, sorry. True. Yeah. Just... So, so, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, I really, really enjoyed the uh, the presentation, Gustav's presentation, in particular, and, and and especially his notion on the sort of whole core idea of of of, uh, of Scandinavia, Scandinavian and Nordic countries. I myself, I'm 25% Swede. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm painfully aware that uh, that the, the, the Swedish brand in Japan in particular is is so much stronger than uh, the Danish brand. Um, but I do have a specific question for Gustav, though. I, I think um, especially when it comes to sort of balancing these different levels of of branding, especially with regards to the Scandinavian or the Hoku idea and the Swedish, like how do you set it apart in particular? Because I know, I think this must be 15 years ago, something to that extent. There was this thing called the Scandinavian Tourist Board where there was an effort made mm -hmm. to make a collective push for the Nordic countries together and to pool a bunch of resources doing that. Uh, to my knowledge, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I do wonder how to, how to set yourself apart and how to be part of that sort of the Hulk War idea um, I noticed when, when uh, Gustav, you mentioned these idea, the core values of creativity, innovation, transparency, sustainability, these are exactly the same. This is exactly the same narrative we hear in Denmark in terms of nation branding. This is what we want to pursue as a nation abroad and particularly in Japan as well. So I'll be very keen to hear his take on that. Right, um, Gustav, I might, might bring you straight back in response. So. Sure, thank you. Happy to, to jump in directly. I, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and I think, I think the answer is, uh, in some areas, we don't really need to, to diversify because that Hoko idea is, is a strong one and it's a positive brand as well. Uh, and uh, like you said, Jacob, the, um, most of, of the values that we promote or that we, that we talk about from the five Nordic countries are the same. Uh, we talk about uh, openness and transparency, participation in, in democratic procedure, we talk about gender equality, we talk about all these things, um, and sustainability not the least. Um, the time when we, start, when we start feeling that we should diversify is uh, when the companies come into the pictures. Uh, because Ericsson and Nokia are actually competitors and, and so on. Uh, but when you look at, for instance, um, say that we arrange a Nordic seminar around um, renewable energy, uh, then of course the Danish embassy uh, will do their best to, uh, to name the names of, of the windmill producers uh, of Denmark, um, some of the biggest in the world. And uh, we don't really have those, but in Sweden, some of the, some of the makers of parts of those uh, wind plants are actually in Sweden, even though the product in the end is, is Danish. So also in terms of uh, our economies being so intertwined, we also actually, in terms of business promotion, uh, support each other, uh, sometimes not even, not even knowing it. Um, so it's, when it comes down to a specific product, say that we do um, cultural promotion, we speak about literature, then of course, again, the values are the the same, but the products are different. Um, and we're not here to, to sell specific products, but as an embassy, it's always uh, beneficial to sort of to speak about more aggregate uh, ideas, such as the values behind a story or, 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 or so, and then sort of pull in the products or the, the people behind it in there in the event. So I don't really feel there's a big, um, it's not a big contest. And we are
So if I'm, I'm, I think we lost you for a second there. Maybe you, you, you froze a little bit, but I think you were just finishing up your remarks there. So um, maybe just a, a brief dropout. Um, actually, what, one, one very specific thing I'd like to ask in, 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 the, in the Swedish versus the Danish thing and whatnot, and it has been, it has been said to me in the past, um, people more on the Danish side, um, that, you know, Sweden, uh, the, the, there is this interesting kind of paradox that the, they're so close, you know, that um, Denmark, of course, has done so much for the reputation of hockey oh. design, you know, the brand of, of uh, Scandinavian design um, through, through particularly furniture design. And of course, companies such as Fritz Hansen and Carl Hansen are some of the most you know, uh, hyper premium in terms of product. IKEA, of course, has taken design to the to the masses. Okay, um, and uh, as sort of Finn made the observation that um, you know you go to IKEA if you want to buy the uh, the Swedish knockoff of the uh, Finnish original. Okay, um, uh, Adam, you you did uh, a range of kind of case studies, interviews, particularly with the likes of um, some uh, Fritz Hansen and others. Um, in, in this broader context of country of origin effects, and when, for example, Fritz Hansen moves some of its production to places like Poland, um, and uh, whether that uh, is is a is a branding dilemma there. So, could I bring you in on that? Mm. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's a it's a really good point, and I, I mean, it speaks a little bit to this kind of well, I mean, globalization of supply chains and the like, and as we've just heard with these with the example of you know. A sustain renewable energy and you know who what which country gets their made in stamp on the windmills uh as opposed to the various parts in it which is which is i guess like a an interesting kind of gigantic um you know example of what we're quite often familiar with um in terms of the insides of your iphones or your galaxies or you know that those parts come from all different uh countries as well um and uh, you know i mean at my time of um you know, conducting these interviews again with with companies such as Fritz Hansen, who, as you know, Chris uh, mentioned, were deciding to move a uh, significant amount of their production um, out of uh, Denmark and and to Poland. Um, there was a sense, definitely at the time, that they they do they were getting co um, some you know, uh, complaints or some kind of you know um, messaging about that, that that this is not a good idea, that this was that this was going against what what uh, the uh, it meant to be, uh, you know, a, a Fritz Hansen product, or that going against the, you know, the the heritage of the and the identity of the company and the products themselves made by, um, or originally designed by you know, Aaron Jacobson, um, but the company itself. So that it was well, we only get those comments from uh, Danes. From people inside Denmark, <laughs> and that, that people around the, the the rest of the people in the world aren't so. Uh, which I, ironic in a sense, because I I had actually expected it in some ways, perhaps you know, not to be the opposite. That if if uh, me as an Australian and um, living in Japan, if I wanted to buy a an, a you know a Danish design chair, I would love to have it also made in Den in Denmark. Um, but their sense was that their their customers around the world didn't necessarily see that the, the you know the made in Poland uh, or you know manufactured I'd say in, you know in Poland as necessarily as a as a um, anything that would tarnish the image or or diminish the let's say the Danishness or or at least the the Fritz Hansenness uh, you know of of the product. And there's, a, there's an interesting image. I, I have two uh, Fritz Hansen seven chairs here. One of them is uh, is brand new, and of course it's got made in the EU on it. Um, and the other one, um, which is 20 years old, has kind of you know made in Denmark. And, and it is an interesting observation about mm. how the EU figures as a brand actually, and and um, I arguably has actually given a lot of companies a uh, a kind of a, a certain uh, advantage in in still leaning on europeanness even if not necessarily you know that very narrow country of origin effect um i'd like to bring Jorge in now um some very interesting observations here uh, obviously from from gustav um and from sven and you're about to be um still working very much with japanese clients but being based in um uh, the netherlands um come first of august um, so your response both to all the issues there, but also your own very particular thinking on on being not not exactly, you know, I don't think you're going to be a nomad per se, but uh, digitally distant, but um, working day to day with uh, clients here. 
yeah, I mean, of course, there will be challenges, um, namely the time zone, of course. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people, like if you can sort of imagine agencies or brands, for example, they normally have like a morning stand up or whatever it is, uh, which is frankly like it's going to be like 4 a.m. for me. Uh, so that's, that's going to be incredibly difficult to attend. But the good news is, um, you know, like like it's it, the COVID for better for worse. Like like many mentioned, um, it it it's fast tracked this remote working style. Um, a lot of companies, for example, might not have had um, sort of Zoom or Microsoft Teams subscription a few years ago, but then most of them now do. So there's a lot of resources and tools available for people like myself and other com- other people working outside uh, outside the office, maybe domestically or internationally, to take advantage of. Um, the one thing that is really difficult, and I can kind of foresee this already, is uh, if you are dealing with market that you're not living in, um, you kind of lose touch with them more or less. So um, that sort of like sensibility and being able to read the room almost, uh, that's going to be a really tricky one for me. So, um, so that's if you can sort of balance that, then I guess, um, you know, on a practical level, there's not much uh, interference. But like I said, uh, there's that sort of meta level of information that you kind of get by living in the market or living in the place. Um, similar to some, how some people argue that you, you do have, want to come into an office every once in a while just to see you know, how it's going and you know, talk to people that you don't normally talk to, et cetera. Right, right. Um, I'm, all, I'm always left wondering, just reflecting on how I live my own life with I'm smack bang in the middle of Tokyo, just how much uh, our daily experience of local culture is actually intermediated by digital means anyway, that, um, you know, if we're, we get our news, whether it's a kind of Yahoo news or whatever, and then insofar as we have conversations with locals, very often it's actually framed by um, so much of what we, we're reading it equally, we could be reading it in Copenhagen or, or wherever. Um, and so to, to a significant degree, I think a key thing with social media, for example, is the quality of your social media experience is entirely a function of who you choose to actually follow, for example. Um, and um, the, it just like these days with uh, kind of uh, algorithmic uh, pricing where no, no two people pay the same price for, uh, for a seat on the same flight, uh, people can be sitting next to each other in a, a, all on their iPhones and no two people are having the same experience of, of their environment. But it, it is the the happenstance, isn't it? The the kind of the accidental meeting of things um, and meeting of peoples, where obviously place uh, still uh, matters. Um, Sven, I might I might come back to you on that briefly and then open up to uh, everybody. Um, what's your sense on that? Of just how much you you do need to be seeing um, people face to face? You've got an impressive team of people who are very comfortable with working um, remotely and have been doing that for. For several years now, um, but I know I know that you are extraordinarily well known in Tokyo, of course, <laughs> and uh, you're a familiar face. You know, you're. Um, ha- how has the digital um, empowered and set you back? Um, so, um, so generally, this I kind of want to go back on on also on that topic of even being an employee because I'm more and more sensing that employees in this telework landscape are losing quite a lot on the human side and I feel that they're almost like permanently employed freelancers um, where where you're ultimately uh, capped from going up the ranks because because purely purely being in a in a telecom in that sort of remote way you've been reduced to sort of a function um, because you're just you're just going through certain mechanics rather than actually building new things. Because all of the building happens actually when you are talking to people. It's it's when you were talk when you were mentioning earlier that people are saying, well, is it worth the journey of coming to the university? And I would say, yes, because even the journey itself is worth the journey. Um, because because then you start to have a conversation with somebody on the way. Um, you you might find a new input on something. I mean, this is also the, the difference between going into a physical shop that is curated um, rather than just going to Amazon where it just gives you again what you already wanted. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going all over the place, but simply saying or, that- Or what you've already bought, they try and say you yeah. four, four taps, right? <laughs> so, yes, yeah. because, because I mean, I'm, I'm taking it all over the place, but, but ultimately I'm trying to say that when you are stuck in this digital bubble, you're just going through the same motions day in, day out. 
and and then and I think that limits very much the capability of moving forward and and then to the point of how does that that affect my business well um terribly I mean it's 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 fine for sustaining but it's it's terrible for growth um and so with existing client relationships it's fine uh for internal communications at this point it's fine but we're not doing anything new that way and so I, I have to travel back and forth between Kyoto and Tokyo. Um, I will be again in Tokyo next week for two days just to have meetings. And then again, the following week again for just two days. And, and the only reason why I'm choosing to be in Kyoto is because of mental sanity, um, of, of having a, you know, being surrounded by beauty and enjoying ludicrously good food. But, but for, for business terms, no, it doesn't work. Right. Um, that was the big thing I wanted to ask you without prying too deeply into how you run your rapidly growing business. But, you know, the new lead generation, um, obviously, from an academic point of view, it's it's a very ideational thing. I mean, this is why academics um, come together every year in different places for conferences. People tend to think it's more just, the, you know, the lifestyle benefits. But the truth is, it's the um, it's the uh, the biggest false economy around because you nearly kill yourself trying to get the paper written in advance. But there is this these. Um, happenstance meetings and and uh, interactions which lead to project uh, collaboration subsequently so um how 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 did people through the last two years go about new lead generation sven and also good stuff from the point of view of you know being being first secretary trade and economy i mean obviously you've got established constituencies on the government side but so much of what you do with the kind of the trade uh initiation is really about leads and following them, right? And how, how did you do that digitally? So maybe, maybe first Sven and then to Gustav, and then we'll open up to everybody. Um, I think on my side, I'm still very lucky that um, it's mostly word of mouth still, but I, can, but I can feel that spending less time with clients also means that you get pushed out of their memory. Um, and, and, it, this goes back to that relevance topic. You have to be you have to be in people's face faces to for them to remember you. Um, and and I found that um, clients, particularly with a lot of internal movement, um, if you're not present, because after all, many of these Zoom calls, it's sort of like a one on one conversation, or maybe a couple of people. But you're not walking through a corridor and just being sort of oh, this person just joined us. That that wouldn't happen um, on a Zoom call. And so what has happened with um, one or two clients where then the key contact point left um, and then you wouldn't have a goodbye dinner, you wouldn't be introduced to the next person. And then suddenly you get an out of office email that simply says they've moved on. And then sort of with that, then the door very quickly shuts um, because you're not part of the constant conversation. Um, um, and I'm also weary of um, ev with everybody now trying to get get your attention at the same time there's too many mailing lists there's too much on linkedin there's there's simply because everybody has to use the same digital means to contact people it means that your inboxes are too full with content and so the actually the only way to break through that is again by having a physical conversation um, and so I haven't, people would say, you know, and then oh, you have to put good content out there and people come to you. I don't know about that. Um, I think it needs something really breakthrough in order for that to work. Um, it's still at the end of the day, meeting, meeting in person and having a real, real relationship with people that comes first. Right, that's profoundly insightful. It also makes me feel a little bit better too, because um, my young son mocks my appallingly low view rates on all of my content on YouTube and thinks it's it's my thumbnails suck. <laughs> okay, um, but uh, then I point here to him to a whole bunch of YouTubers who explain about why actually the vast majority of YouTubers don't get any views and uh, the happenstance that actually gets people to to break. But good stuff. How, how do you in this era of attention? scarcity uh where people are literally overwhelmed with the <laughs> demands for their attention just through their own phone let alone walking through a city how, how do you first of all find leads and then get people's attention when you when you see potential 
It's a very good question. And I think I can only agree with, with Sven that the end goal must be to meet. Um, because the end goal in our, we call it international relations, right? And and it's it's building that relation person to person. Also, also on a in in a international summit between countries on the top level, it's it's the actual relations between the individuals in the end that counts, that makes that uh, that agreement possible, etc. So so that's big part of our mission here is could, yeah as a diplomat I, i'm posted here for a few years and i'm expected to not rarely eat my lunch alone but always try to meet somebody and and that's been hard of course during the pandemic but um we've been we've been talking about digital diplomacy and i think uh, that does make sense uh, in a way but even more sense maybe is Makes makes talking about public diplomacy with digital media, digital village, etc. It's actually um, on the one hand branding and on the other political messaging, but it's it's not very interactive in the end uh, until we through those channels make people join our seminars or webinars or come to the embassy for an event or so, um, even if it's a small one these days. So. Um, I guess it's a public diplomacy in the sense, like we were discussing very early on here, that it's 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 hard to have a message that suits everyone, but still it's public, so you need to you, you cannot stand out too much and be too controversial in, in what you say because everybody can read it. But we still try to focus as much as possible on different target groups in our different channels, uh, because when we speak about sustainability in Japan, we'd like to reach. Uh, we've decided to try to reach a younger audience because the future is with the young and that's also where the interest in actually changing society in this direction is the biggest in Japan. Um, and it's not just about selling Swedish sustainable products, which is part of it, of course, but in the end, we also want to politically message about this because we, our government that we represent also wants to change the world in this direction and change societies, not only our own. Oh. Thank you. Clear These implications. Clear implications. We should get you on on campus as soon as possible, talking to as many <laughs> young people as possible. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. We like to think that Waseda students will go on, um, and Sophia students, um, even more so than the Torday people who think they've changed the world. And there's, I've heard Sven joke in the past that um, um, Torday graduates think they run the world, but the truth is that it's actually more like uh, Waseda graduates and Keo graduates and others. And well, let's say Sophia, Sophia graduates who really are making the decisions out there, particularly in, in, in big companies and whatnot, where it really does make a huge difference. Um, so um, over to yourselves, and um, I might bring in, first of all, uh, one of my brilliant semis here, um, Susie, have you, have you got uh, any thoughts, comments? And um, then uh, please just put your hand up, anyone who would like to ask a question, make a comment. So over to yourself, first of all, Susie. I'll put you on the spot, but um you always have something brief to say <laughs> so yes oh <laughs> not, not sure actually um i think every all the panelists everybody who spoke today um first of all i thank you so much for uh, participating in our meeting today and um i thought that so i've been conducting research um as a research assistant like so, um for uh professor uh Carrier, but um uh, most of my research has been online, and it's more about how um, regarding uh, Japanese dento koge, or traditional arts and crafts. But um, it really, um, I think, uh, Sven's uh, comment really brought into perspective how um, I, I think I've always focused on the uh, positive aspects of teleworking and just kind of the online experience in general and the um, the positive, I'd say, deluge of content that it bought, but um, uh, I think it just really brings into perspective how uh, we really need to start moving forward instead of, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I can't really put my thoughts into a cohesive uh, sentence today, but um, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, there is definitely a need to uh, move forward from this persisting COVID climate of um, where everybody's just kind of um, so, so, uh, used to this kind of convenience online yeah yeah that um that's right not you can get very accustomed to staying in bed right 
<laughs> um, I was very struck by, by uh, uh, what Gustav said earlier about where at some point we have to declare this is done with. Um, I, I'm sure Adam would agree that actually a number of countries probably just did that and arguably did that too soon. And a country like Australia that actually went from COVID zero to now one of the highest per capita rates of COVID infection and hospitalization of anywhere in the world um, shows that the, the flip flop between the two can be quite severe. That I really do think that Japan actually all in all has been very mature in terms of um, never having severe lockdowns, but also um, understanding um, that through effectively communication, suasion, um, common sense kind of can prevail. And so hopefully we can, can transition um, to, a, to a nice kind of you know, hybrid world of where we use the digital to enable interesting collaborations, but don't lose any of the, the human kind of face-to-face -face dimension. I um, mean, particularly with say dental corgi and whatnot, you know, um, um, you are not going to appreciate traditional arts and crafts, no matter how much you try, through just simple digital representations of the works. You know, you really do need to hold, hold the uh, hold the chow one and haika you know, and actually feel it, feel it in your hands. Um, so, thoughts, comments. We've got got a bit of time here. I know some of the Sophia folks technically they finish at um, ten past, and then they've got fifteen minutes uh, to go to another class. Our folks have um, longer. Um, so, uh, Fred, what about yourself? Um, oh, it turned on my video. Uh, um, so I've heard that I, I keep using Apple as an example. Apple, uh, they want, they are demanding all their uh, employees to come back to their campus and the people who are very comfort, they're comfortable with their bedroom, working in their bedroom are um did not they don't want to go back um in that case i've heard uh other companies i think bloomberg as well uh they're just firing them and just employing straight up employing very enthusiastic interns as a full-time job of uh, giving them a full-time job but sort of a question for savan i guess um how would you deal with what do you how would you deal with that how would you transition towards a more uh hum, um yeah back to the our old days or great question not... as, a, as a as as a ceo uh how do, how do you strike that balance i don't pretend that i have the answer after all i am in kyoto and uh everybody else is in tokyo so clearly um i am not um practicing what i'm preaching um, I'm also finding it very difficult for, um, for figuring out a way to uh, get everybody on the same page because I'm finding what one of my sort of catchphrases has become sort of the problem with diversity and inclusion is it's diverse and it's inclusive um, because it means ultimately you have to accept everybody um, in, with their own unique needs. And, and that often then means that um, with um, remote working, everybody has now been given the opportunity to schedule their day according to their own needs. And so um, this, is, this has caused actually a lot of issues also um, for simply scheduling anything with more than two people. Um, and so getting, getting, two, getting the entire team together um, around the table has been almost rendered impossible. Um, and, and ultimately, it always comes back to me. Um, and so I sort of feel that I'm on one hand, the CEO and the caretaker at the same time, um, because, because I then have to sort of slot in with everybody's schedule. Um, I mean, I don't want to paint a completely bleak um, picture. I, I, think, I think things that have worked is just to have very set schedules for certain things so that we do have uh, an all hands um, weekly meeting to make sure that we all do communicate then. We also initiated um, a coffee time, um, which then also is everybody's encouraged to join that if they can. Um, but that again is something where it, it, because after all, we're trying to create more sort of dynamic communication and particularly where the work we do is very much about being inspired by each other and the experiences we have. So, so then trying to also then um, 
uh, institutionalized like a sharing session. And, and, but that also keeping that, forcing it is actually quite difficult um, because inevitably a deadline is always treated as more important than, than just chatting. Um, but actually the chatting is important. So, so um, basically institutionalizing uh, nonsense um, is, is, is sort of one way of, of, of solving it. And um, we've also initiated more um, go out of the office together kind of initiatives. So, so when I'm in town, which of course is regularly, but that we would then all together go to a museum um, or we would meet in a cafe. And again, we keep it relatively casual, but also with like a little bit of pushing that it would be good for us to do it. And so then as a result, the, the online sessions um, become much more about getting the work done, but we also have the time to just connect. Um, huge informant. I'll, I'll just make a very quick observation that um, some of them, some of the students and I teach a um, intermediate seminar on negotiation and um, there uh, particularly in a Japanese context one of the absolutely fascinating things is that I have students who for weeks I will be talking at them and I even I've given them primed them set them up I'll ask a question it's like sheen there's kind of no response as soon as you break out into groups everyone comes to life um, and I've also noticed, um, particularly collaborating with uh, architects and architecture education, this remarkable thing that happens in studio learning, just simply get people up on their feet, off a chair, um, standing in front of something pinned up on a board, and people who normally never speak um, are full of life and full of interaction. So, yeah, even just get, getting out and going a walk for a walk together or something, I think there is the really interesting kind of spatial dynamics of communication. That said, I also know um, from having both taught online and then bringing people face to face that there are a bunch of shy, brilliant students who will speak online, um, who won't actually speak in the classroom environment because they're intimidated by the um, um, much more kind of fluid, native English speaking, loud and kind of self-confident individuals in the room. So in the end, I think what we really do need is the, the active role of the facilitator. I don't think you can just leave people to it because communication doesn't happen. The mavens, the people who kind of catalyze these interactions, who call people out, who, who know the shy, brilliant person um, has the most interesting things to say, but won't say it um, unless they're actually kind of drawn out and enabled to, to do that. Um, but again, here's me. The, the boisterous native speaker may talking. <laughs> may I respond? Please. To because yes. I find what you just said last, the last point you just made really interesting because you see that companies like WeWork, for example, already have community managers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, it, it serves a slightly different function to what you were talking about because there it would be the WeWork office, the person who's at the reception desk um, also is a community manager. And the intention there is th uh, that they would organize, they would have a budget to organize little events for then different people in the WeWork to meet each other. And they would also actively try to connect people. And now thinking about, and, and I mean, sure, that comes from a slightly different perspective because it's a WeWork office is you have different companies and you're hoping that there's synergy between them. But what's the difference between a company and an individual, right? I mean, to just have somebody inside of a company who actively tries to say, hey, you're interested in that. Have you met this person? Because they're actually interested in the same thing. Seems like a very interesting role for the future, particularly as then it can't organically happen. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe over to, uh, to, to Gustav then, is, is, is a critical role then, as you said, with your embassy, um, maybe more and more will you actually be a catalyst function. Um, that's my understanding of all of my friends who've been involved in trade promotion, say with Austrade in the Australian context, that it's all about leads and connecting people rather than, than championing particular agendas. And there's always a tension with what head office wants. Um, is, so is, is, is that really what we need? Do we, do we, do we need um, just more proactive enablers uh, that maybe are technology neutral? Well, thank you from from my perspective. Absolutely, that's that's what we're here for, and that's why that's why I mentioned uh, the embassy as an event space because that's creating the space, even if it's a digital one, creating a platform where people can meet and making sure the right people 
come there to meet. That's that's sort of the way diplomacy has been working for for hundreds of years. Uh, if I could just add a reflection after hearing what was said about uh, about WeWork and meeting uh, all, the, all the sort of extracurricular activities that you have on the side of of jobs in order to make things work smoothly. I just came to think of my time as a as a student. I remember starting my studies of political science in in Uppsala University. Uh, back in 2005, and the, and the principal of this of this program, political science, he said, "Welcome, welcome to your studies." Uh, but remember that the studies is not the most important. I don't know if you, this is something you said uh, to us at all or Sophia, but uh, at least in Uppsala at that time, um, the, the the idea was that you should manage your studies really well. You should come out with with good grades from this. But what will bring you somewhere uh, is the network uh, you you culture during this time, the activities, uh, the interests that you culture and nurture, uh, and and for me that was very clear. Uh, that's also what happened. Like uh, all the all the side activities that I did, that's where I met the friends who then brought me into uh, situations where eventually I got a, I got a job that I really liked, and and this brought me here to to Japan today. Uh, it's it's maybe. Um, generalizing but but all these things of course are easily lost if you if you stay online uh, so i think it's super important to to make sure that those extra side things things on the side are, are kept alive still very wise advice but i'd say in my experience that wasada students don't need much encouragement to <laughs> be focused on doing things other than study uh, but but uh hugely important this point that actually by bringing yourself to campus and these, these i keep using the word happenstance I, I can top your anecdote um i was in a uh class at the university of queensland as an undergraduate in political science plato theory uh plato uh from was it from plato from, uh, from hobbes it was from hobbes to the political theory from hobbes to the present day was the course and it was in the early in the morning and i was the only student to turn up and the academic was obviously still drunk he brushed his cigarette smoke out of his own face looked at me and said "Picaria is and i said yes and he said f off um get a life there's much better things to do on a university campus and sit and listen to a broken down drunk like me <laughs> but seriously and he says don't worry i'll give you a decent grade and i left um and some students have heard that story in the past i haven't yet told students to f off at wasado but <laughs> um we want to be out there making connections so um rather than people tell people to f off um i'm close to the scheduled time here uh do you have any specific questions that people would like to ask please far away i'll indulge on our um, and the patience of our uh, special guests for a bit. Anyone like to have a go? I mean, after that, then <laughs> I've kind of kill, killed the foundations. So, well, Adam as co-host then, would you, can I, can I um, go over to yourself? This has um, been very nice having the collaboration again with Sophia, so um yeah. over to yourself and then a final word from each of our discussants oh and and my apologies i got a message from um uh yuka murakami she wasn't able to join us she got stuck in um her uh, other event for the longest time and and couldn't uh take her leave and i think that is the uh, the reality uh, the realities of digital that we we can seriously overcommit to being in multiple places at once so um adam so some some closing thoughts yeah well indeed uh, uh thank you chris and then thanks again for for organizing this this, this is a really you know, really wonderful session um and so actually my my kind of my maybe perhaps my last point not so much on the, the maybe even the, the digital or the diplomacy side of thing but i mean something again that that uh, sven mentioned kind of really uh well, stuck with me in that asking whether whether it's worth the journey and there's this kind of quote and, you know, the idea that well actually yes the journey is worth the journey is, is actually something that I think uh, would be really great for everyone to remember uh, I mean in the students at Sophia something that I actually regularly get them to do as part of this class is actually to to you know on their way to campus to look around them uh, to you know take a look at communication take a look at messages take a look at what uh, how, how different organizations are trying to speak to you through different mediums and, and using different messages and to you know um, you know to, to, to be more aware of, of all the different examples around you um, and and as well as the world around you in general um, but just again to just try to 
uh, sense of why some messages are, are you know cap capture your attention you know more than others and then what what works and, and what doesn't um, but but also that it's again it's a, it's a reminder of that um, you know there are a lot of uh, different uh, organizations people you know trying to interrupt you or disrupt you from you know kind of from your day and trying to you know um, and you know, the question is from a, you know, communication perspective, uh, whether it's, you know, corporate communication or diplomacy, you know, do you want to be trying to interrupt or disrupt or, or rather how are you trying to uh, engage and, and create this kind of, you know, be, be relevant? Um, you know, how can you, you know, from a, or from a, from a diplomacy perspective, you know, for a country, um, have a, such a, okay, perhaps have a succinct um, understanding of the values that you're trying to represent that you could in a sense encase it or, or encompass it in in, in so-called a way of life you know that that people intrinsically get oh yeah this is the you know the, the Nordic way of life or the, or the as opposed to you know could you say what the the Japanese way of life you know could be um, the, you know and and how many different audiences would would get that would and would would how would uh, that resonate with uh, and so uh, that ability to, again, being aware of what's around you, but also being able to kind of boil down uh, a core message into a into that that kind of um, um, yeah essence is, is I think is it's a really great thing to, to look at and see see how other people are doing it. So yeah. thanks. Um, I'll finish on that. And and that that dovetails very nicely with a simple observation I want to make, and in, in, in that I think will resonate with um, very much with Adam. This notion of a kind of way of life, isn't it? It's an incredibly powerful kind of branding resource. Um, and the thing I just simply want to emphasize, picking up on what um, um, Adam was saying, is that you know any kind of communication, some communication design, it's 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 kind of like love in a sense. You know, there's the pitch, but there's also the timing. You know, it's kind of right person, <laughs> wrong time. Um, there are certain life stages we go through. We, our needs change over time, um, and we which means that um, most of the time uh, we're actually very we're very efficient at screening out messages that we don't perceive are directly relevant to us. But I, I'm sure, Adam, over your experience of the last year and a half of suddenly becoming the father to twins while also having a two-year-old, I'm sure you recognize every single brand in relation to strollers, um, particularly for twins, right? Stuff you would never have paid the slightest attention to, okay? Similarly, in a couple of years' time, you'll know everything about Lund or Cedar brands, okay? Um, so there, there is really, uh, to, to go back to what uh, Sven said, you know, re relevance and reach. So it's relevance at a certain juncture in, in, in someone's life path, life journey with certain needs. And then, of course, from the, uh, the point of view of the people doing the communication design, you know, reaching those people at the right time. OK, um, that's one of the stupid things about algorithmic uh messaging isn't it that um, it normally tells us hey buy another lens cap uh because you've already bought a lens cap right uh so it's obviously just yeah great that would have been terrific a week ago but now is is wrong um so i'll i'll go then to Corhe for final closing remarks from yourself uh yeah thank you so much for this opportunity and it's been great sort of like listening to um what people feel about it especially like when it comes to um so like you know what what some of the benefits that sort of like working in the like in person brings about uh, as well um you know I, I sort of go back to the very beginning but when it comes to sort of like a digital diplomacy um countries like sweden uh denmark and even the uk i work for uh fortunately they do have you know some diehard fans um they they, they do generally have a good perception uh amongst the japanese um but then the, the tricky part is okay so how do we how do we get them to, how do we get the average people, you know, the, your next door Tanaka-san to think about it positively, right? Um, so, you know, like, like, uh, uh, sorry, uh, like Gustav said, so like in the same way that you don't really think about Sweden when you first wake up, you know, when, when you next go to uh, plan a meal, like how do you get them to go to a Swedish restaurant or how do you get them to go to a pub? Uh, that's really a difficult part, especially in my experience, <laughs> it was very really difficult to promote the British food in Japan. <laughs> uh, uh, everyone saw everyone sort of like wrote on the face, face of course like uh, the British food they're not really tasty whatever 
uh, but that changing that perception is incredibly difficult. But then again, like I said, there are some diehard fans who are, you know, happy to be ambassadors, uh, who are happy to spread the words. Um, yeah, just sort of nurturing that relevancy on a day to day basis, uh, even ever so incrementally, is so important uh, when it comes to digital diplomacy in my own experience. Um, it doesn't just mean, you know, promoting the product brand or culture or whatever it is. It's also about writing support as a country. So uh, it's not just a, uh, the, the figure really isn't ultimately, unlike, you know, consumer brands, maybe the figure ultimately isn't how many followers you got on Twitter or Instagram. The, the, the important metric really is, okay, when you ask a person about this country, whether that's Sweden, UK, or wherever it is, do they have a positive image? And if so, what, what do they think of? Is it, is it sustainability thing or is it, uh, is it like uh, whatever the big car manufacturers they have? What is it? Um, so yeah, it was very great too. Um, I don't normally get to talk, uh, talk or hear about this kind of thing either. Uh, it's been some time since I last worked with them. So it was great to have this uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kohei. And um, right, Jakob, mm, Copenhagen, thanks. Yeah, cheers. Thank you very much. I, I, really, I really, really enjoyed the session as well. Um, I also particularly like the uh, the presentation that Norika Yagi she gave on the on the digital presence of different uh, European countries. That was really interesting to me, and I look forward to looking into the the link that she shared to all of us. Uh, so thank you, Norika, for that. Um, another few things. I also the the with regards to the, the Swedish embassy. The as as several people mentioned, the idea of it being an open event space. I think is is uh, is is incredibly valuable and uh, and um, something that I think the Danish embassy should uh, learn a little bit more from. They're doing it to a certain extent, but not, not enough, to my opinion. Um, and then a few other things that really resonated with me. I like your notion, Chris, on the Netflix University, and uh, I like Sven's idea of institutionalizing nonsense in the context of COVID work. So, uh, so thank you all for that. I really appreciated it. Cheers. Thank you. And um, over to Sven, and then I'll bring Nordica in. So yeah, Sven. Thanks. Well, not much to say, but I will say that uh, I think it's fantastic the work that the Swedish embassy is doing, and I'm very curious to see how now all of the other countries are going to ramp up uh, the online presence. Um, and and um, as a half German, as a half Brit, um, I'm particularly curious to see again how national stereotypes will uh, prevail in this space, uh, where I think the British website will be fun and the German will be stoic and bland. Um, and I hope to be disproven in both directions. <laughs> so that's my comment. Right, right. The, the, one, thing I, the one thing I will say in defense of Germany, um, and uh, students have just had, had an example, they had a question on a final quiz, was that Germany did that very clever thing, you know, in the middle of COVID, where they said, you can't go anywhere, right? So where, what are you dreaming of? And that was hugely successful. Um, this idea of kind of, in the words of uh, a guy who used to head communications at Nissan, opening an account in the consumer's mind, which you can subsequently make deposits in. So um, uh, at least uh, there, there, there's some innovations coming out of there. Right. Um, but also one of the things that I think the longer we live um, or uh, we have all of these moments where, oh, my God, people are living the cliche. Right. <laughs> it's sick. We see this in so many contexts. That, um, uh, Nordica, um, maybe if we can finish up there where we started with um, your concluding thoughts. Sure. Uh... I, yeah, thank you so much to everyone for sharing their thoughts. It was incredibly insightful. And there were some very interesting points that uh, many of you brought up. In particular, Sven mentioning how internet is kind of like a large phone book. Uh, I was thinking about, you know, being in the digital era and how there's a saturation of everything that's kind of in your face trying to get your attention. Perhaps what we're looking for is some form of escapism. <laughs> um, so like living the cliche for certain like, countries such as Good Game for Korea or uh, different like uh, staple things for different countries kind of allow you to vicariously live in a certain universe, like with the prevalence of, you know, Marvel even having like a cinematic universe, maybe in the digital era and digital and cultural diplomacy, we can move into something like having a mini online village such as Sweden is doing right now, where people can imagine themselves in the environment and escape for a bit. I think that would be a pretty interesting way to move forward uh, from here. But yeah, 
<laughs> right. Um, I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg wants to own it. He'll be trying to try, trying to monetize space in in virtual worlds. But but I mean, obviously, this this is this is why we have public diplomacy, isn't mm. it? This idea that actually there is the commons um, and there is the global commons. Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to wrap up with um, actually then a uh, another quote then from from Gustav. So I, I, I love that line about in your job, you're expected to really eat alone, um, <laughs> that it really is about making connections. And of course, once we get COVID behind us, um, this is where we want to get back to. And um, just an anecdote on this, um, which actually speak, it's it's the story of Isama Noguchi. And how is Amanoguchi when um, in the days before we had any kind of obviously digital connectivity, um, he went to Paris. Um, he had been, he really wanted to meet Giacometti, very famous sculptor. Um, and he'd heard that they hung out at a certain cafe and uh, wandered down to that particular cafe. Um, and um, lo and behold, within 24 hours, he uh, was actually working with the guy. Uh, so place does matter um, and there's this sense of, of being able to connect with, with um, people. But I suspect that ironically, although we can reach out to people so easily, that actually people are much more defensive these days. Um, that actually, um, rather than the Swedish embassy, which is imagined as this open event space, maybe many more people psychologically look more like the Australian embassy, which actually looks <laughs> looks more like the American compound in Baghdad uh, than an open kind of drop-in space. You know, um, Dentacore Commercial, the architects who designed that have, have ne kind of never lived that down. It does look like it's been absolutely kind of bomb-proofed um, to get in and out um, of the place and is thoroughly um, uh, unapproachable uh, as a consequence. Uh, so yeah, my my own belief, and I believe Adam shares uh, this, and I hope most students do too, is that there is still a relevant place for the university, precisely as a place where people come um, open uh, and with with common shared values um, around um, free exchange of ideas, mutual respect, um, forging long term kind of collaborations. Um, if there's no longer a place for that in the world, I don't see there's a place for the university, um, which is a kind of a sobering prospect for any of us who actually uh, earn a living in higher education. So thank you so much for joining. Um, clearly, the takeaway is that digital is enabling too, and, we've, that, and thanks to digital, we've been able to do this. Um, all of the students participating, I know it's been a little bit intimidating to try and put your hand up virtually and um, ask questions. Uh, but I would encourage you to send some a uh, message uh, to, to me on the Wasada side and to Professor Johns on the Sophia side, and we might put some of those questions together and forward them to the participants. So thank you very much. And um, uh, I originally told Gustav 3.30, I've been a bit indulgent, even though the program said 3.15. So I've kind of, um, it's a good sign when we don't want to stop. Uh, so thank you again to everyone for your participation. Um, uh, Adam, your students still have another session with you, but my students don't. This is the end of the semester, so stay safe. Um, very unlikely to be eaten by a shark in Japan. It's a much greater risk if you're in Australia. <laughs> okay, stay safe over, over the summer. And I hope to see many of you next semester and all of those other folks who are, who are not the students. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a very enjoyable session. So all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yes, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. All the best, guys. Thank you. You have to be in a meeting, Adam. <laughs> My apologies. I'll, uh, I'll talk later. <laughs> That's the head of the department being Thanks, chased. Man. Let you go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Please take your leave.